The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantitis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into IntelliFlow was born in Nairobi, Kenya, created a video game at school that reached number one in the gaming charts at the time, was a film script writer and is a fellow Tolkien fan. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Nick Etok. Woo! Welcome. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Thank you very much. I didn't know we were fellow Tolkien fans. That's fantastic. Oh, Tolkien is particularly Lord of the Rings. Well, and The Hobbit. They're the only yeah. books I own where the spine is no longer visible. I've read them so much. Oh, I've got a book just the same. It was um, my grandfather gave me the original Lord of the Rings, and it's um, it looks brilliant because it's right. old. But just like you, the spine has just fallen away on it, and I, it's really sad. I've got to be really careful with it. That <laughs> right? It's but that it's when you love it that much, you know. It's yeah, at yeah. that point, um, and I feel sad for kids these days that they may never have a book like that because it's all on Kindle or whatever. Exactly. Like the, yeah. So. Oh, I'm so excited to dive into IntelliFlow and, and all the things that you guys can do. Um, but first, let's just get to know you a little better through your own tech usage. Um, what is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Of course I use emojis. Everyone uses <laughs> emojis, right? Actually, yeah. I'll tell you what, though. I have changed my use of emojis, oh. and I changed it because of, of um Education in Australia. So I was at the FPA, FPA event in November yep. in Sydney, like just just last year. Yeah, and there, there, there was um, there was someone talking on about what emojis actually mean these days, ah. and it really educated me. There was this piece of, I always, you know, I'm, I'm probably of an age where, where I'm slightly behind the majority of people in, on emoji use. Yeah. So my default emoji used to be just a simple smiley face emoji. And right. then I discovered at the FBA last November that that means passive aggressive. And I thought, oh, that's no good. I know. <laughs> I was the same. It's like thumbs up is a similar thing. Like yeah. these days it can have a lot of sarcasm in the thumbs up. You know, exactly. don't you love that? This this little picture now has sarcasm implied. Yeah. How, <laughs> how, how were you to know that? How were you to know that? Right, it's ridiculous. Right. This stuff's fraught with danger, I tell you. <laughs> so exactly. I'm trying to expand my, my emoji use. Right. Uh, I, I, I quite like the flame one at the moment. That's quite good. Yep. And then the sort of the, um, the, the thank you, you know, put, putting your hands together. I quite yeah. like that one. So I'm trying to trying to uh, m move on from my, my old favourites is the truth. Nice. Well, and in fact, I've got a so conscious like yourself of it that I've now started using Bitmoji, which is when it uses your like a, a cartoon character oh, yes. of you into pictures because then at least it's my, like it's me doing it. <laughs> oh, my yes, gosh. Yes, exactly. Hopefully yeah. I can't like send the wrong message with this anymore. Like <laughs> That is Takes that is an excellent idea. I mean, right. you could always go back to your kids and say, "Is this appropriate to say?" And normally, right. it's no, Dad. What on earth are you no. using that for? Yeah. <laughs> Silly, <laughs> I love it. All right, and so then look, we've all 
all just live with our smartphones, don't we? So you've got to wipe everything off and you're only allowed to keep three apps on your smartphone. What are you keeping? Oh, good one. So um, there's a really boring one, which is Outlook on, on my phone because, you know, that's just work stuff. But the reality yeah. is WhatsApp is the, the app I probably use the most. Uh, that, that's yeah, my okay. default communication with, with, with everyone I communicate with. Um, we kind of, again, from a working perspective, use Slack a lot. So Slack yes. is a really used app on, on my phone. I so much prefer Slack to email. It's just it's just not true how much better it is. It's just fantastic. And then I'm 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 a big sports nut, so I've got various sports for hand, uh, sports oh, okay. um, apps uh, about my my favourite team, who are Liverpool Football Club, who won seven nil on Monday. So you know, oh, that's well not too done bad. you. So, so my husband's a Tottenham fan, so he was quite happy Is too. It? So we, 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 yeah, yeah. So um, very nice. I like it. And Slack's interesting. It hasn't come a long way through financial advice in Australia. Of course, lots of other industries. We could not live without it. In fact, the, the, the business might shut down if we couldn't be using yeah, yeah. Slack. It has replaced, we have a, a zero internal email policy. And so you've got to communicate via Slack. Spot on. Th- th- those those communication trails on, on regular email where you've got lots of people involved and it goes off in different branches and <laughs> People end up responding to the wrong one, and you just think, God, "Why are we doing it this way?" Go yeah. to Slack for everything. I love, I love your, I love your policy. Zero email is a good internally is a good is a good way forward. Yeah, and and emails are harder to send a gift too. We will love gifts yeah. for communicating in this in the team with Slack. Being a bit of humour, you know, it's always a good absolutely. thing. Absolutely, absolutely. All righty, let's dive into IntelliFlow, shall we? So let's take it way up to the sort of high level and give me a sense. And for the listener who maybe is less aware of you guys as a brand or or in the Australian space, where IntelliFlow sits in the advice tech sort of broad spectrum, you know, what category does it sort of fall under? Who are you sort of normally lined up against to give us some context? Yeah, so so I guess I mean our technology uh, stack is quite wide now, Peter. So we we, yep. we two things. So so we do lots of stuff. So that's including things like practice management, revenue management, client portals, financial modeling, and so on. All of these kind of things sit within under the stack of a of a product we call IntelliFlow Office. Yeah. Um, so it's a pretty wide ranging product. Does lots of things, but it's also open architecture. We've been open architecture right since we started in two thousand and four. Okay. Um, so it's, an, it's a central philosophy of the business. So we've got an open API. You can go to the URL today if you want to. In fact, if you want to, you can start writing an integration against our app just by going to that URL. You can sign okay. up. You don't need to talk to anyone. And that means what we've got is a whole bunch of partners. And those partners can be software firms, large and small. It can be product providers, large and even larger. <laughs> <laughs> and those firms just integrate with our, our, our tech. And we think that's really important because it gives uh, advice businesses choice of the tech stack that they want to use. Yeah. And sometimes that's our bits exclusively. Sometimes it's our bits alongside other bits. And yeah. they can mold their tax de- tech stack together because everything is really tightly integrated. Our open architecture approach has something, and this, this boring techie stuff, but it's got mm-hmm. like... 272 endpoints, which means you can pretty much do whatever you want in terms of integrating the technologies. Wow. And that's for, for the listener who, like you say, is sort of not aware of that. The the other end of that is you can, you know, you can transfer the name, <laughs> their postal address, right, is the other end. Yeah, yeah, we integrate. It's like, well, not really, like not where it counts. So you guys really are, so it's a deep level of intended integration if somebody's willing to, you know, utilize um, the open API and sort of build that that bridge between your tool and, and whichever one they need. Exactly, because uh, advisors have seen enough of those um, those point integrations, which are uh, I, I tend to call them marketing integrations, where yeah, yeah, it's just a single piece of data, and you can put a tick tick in the box saying yes, we're integrated with X Y Z firm or whatever. Yeah. But actually, yeah, the reality is is that it's the quality of that integration is actually the most important thing, because you want to use the third party solutions together, because you like them both. But you, hmm. you don't want to rekey. You don't want to rekey data. You want a seamless user experience, and that's what um, that's what our API, DevHub, and, and and store does. And it's exciting to have more and more players in the market having this view because I think 
to date, a lot of Australian advisors would just sort of be ignoring integration only because it was very difficult for it to be possible. So why would you yeah. even bother understanding it as an option? <laughs> it's like, yeah, good, that wonderful thing that you can't have. <laughs> So, yes, you know, it's, absolutely it's, right. It's it's really exciting to see that as sort of the new benchmark is that this is what you should be expecting. And, and Peter, we're hearing that from all the advice firms we talk to. That, I mean, they're a desperate for a change, but also yeah. it, it feels like the the Australian marketplace has been starved of the oxygen required to make a buoyant um, uh, economy or marketplace of software businesses that can move forward and yeah. ultimately deliver better capability to advisors, which means those advisors can deliver engaging experiences with their clients. And that's got to be a good thing. Yeah, exactly. And look, we've sort of touched on it. So I think it it is worth taking just a moment. I am curious about your insights into the difference between, you know, what a UK advisor wants or needs versus an Australian advisor from a tech perspective. Like, what are you guys seeing in the difference? Is it, look, Peter, broadly it's the same or is are the markets at such different points that it's it's quite a different need or request that you get? I think, I mean, well, at, at its essence, uh, financial advice is the same, same yeah. the world around, right? You yeah. know, the outcome of financial advice is, is, is exactly the same. There's local or regional differences between the players and the par- partners in that marketplace, um, but the actual need is just the same. So yeah. what we're seeing more and more is advisors looking for digitized experiences where they can engage effectively with their clients. And, and no matter what the age, I think there used to be this thing in the in the marketplace saying, you know, digital technology and, and client portals and all that kind of stuff so is only for the young. people who are 20s and their 30s and what have you. And and the reality is we look at our data, we've got 368,000 adults using Oof. our client portal today. That's one in, 100, one in every 145 UK adults uses okay. our, finance, our, our client portal technology. And so it's a really big sample size. And what you see from that is that the age group that is most engaged, that logs on most frequently and does stuff within, within the solution are people in their 50s and 60s. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah. And it's an interesting, um, I got asked on a panel a couple of weeks ago about even older clients and, oh, but you know, if say you, your client portal was an app on their phone, oh, but you know, they're not going to want to do that. And I said, well, the thing is though, if you get them to put that app on the phone, they probably only have six other apps. So, <laughs> so you're going to be on the front page, like you'll be top of the pops, you know, that's probably one of the few apps they'll ever use. Um, whereas with, with younger generation, you're going to be seven pages in. Like you're competing for real estate as an app yeah. in that world. So I think with, there's so many assumptions we make with this stuff, isn't there, that what will work or what won't um, yeah. without understanding people's behaviours in a, in a deeper sense. Yeah, and, and the terrible thing is those phrases sort of all came, started and originated um, about 20 years ago when we were <laughs> saying, you know, it's only for the millennials. But 20 years has passed, and not just 20 years has passed, so everyone's a little bit older but not just that, but we also had COVID, which was dreadful in yeah. so many ways it's not true. But what it did mean was that people engaged with their technology for all sorts of really good reasons, and it's just become part of what they do. And that yeah. that applied particularly, I think, um, for people in the in these sort of older age cohorts because they yeah. needed to, because they wanted to, you know, keep in touch with their families, with their grandchildren, whatever it might be. So it's, yeah. uh, it's it's a brave new world for sure. It is, and I do think there's um, been – we've already had the tipping point where for almost every generation it has actually made life easier, whereas I think to your point, prior to even COVID, some of them like, well, I, do I really need to worry about technology, you know, for some of them, whereas, you know, the QR code that could let them do something quite simple, they've got, oh, yeah, that's easier. <laughs> I don't have to fill in my name and address, my, like, or whatever that is. So I do think it sort of did accelerate things, didn't it? You know, in terms yeah. of people's understanding or, or willingness. So, and we've we've sort of got to ride that wave. I think we've got to take advantage of that accelerated learning um, and double down. Yeah, 100%. double down a bit. So, so I mean, essentially, back to your question, Peter. Mm. The needs are the same, but what we do see about the Australian market that's different from the UK marketplace is. The UK marketplace is much more integrated, many more players integrating across, and there's right. there's not that level that, that's happened here. For whatever reason, it hasn't happened here, and we want to provide that. We want to give yeah. advice, advisors a real, a real chance to change and to have a, a vibrant marketplace of technology. 
So then given given all of the elements that sit in in Teleflow Office and, and the pieces that it's providing, then there isn't really in that sense a primary user because I'm betting that the expectation is if you utilize the tool, even if you don't use everything in it, that most or all members of the team should be interacting with it. Is that the, like the general assumption is this is a core part of somebody's tech space as opposed to an ancillary part? Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, absolutely. So you look yeah. at the core users uh, and, you know, core users are either advisors or power planners. That's kind yep. of historically where we've been with administrator people sitting sitting in, in there too. And yep. they tend to be in the application for about six hours a day. You yeah. Know? Okay. So that's kind of how they run their advice business. It's how they deal with initial advice for a client, taking them all the way through that advice ecosystem. So Advi- the the review, the fact finding, the advice recommendations itself, documents uh, shared back, do- SOA shared back with the client, signing of those at- digitally as well, all the way through to implementation. So it covers all of that. And particularly important, or we think really important, is that ongoing servicing of the client thereafter. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the people who use our technology most, it's actually the end client. You know, right. We've got far more end client users than we do have advisor and power plan that uses just because that's the that's you know every advisor in the uk at least those who use the technology um technology well service about 220 clients on average so there's a 220 to 1 ratio of <laughs> uh, of clients versus advisors for those for those firms who adopt it well so we like to see it as an ecosystem where all of the relevant parties are using the software to some extent or another The clients aren't going to be in there six hours a day. Clearly, they're not. But they're going to be in there when they want to be in there. So it sounds like then, um, because the you know the evolution or or introduction then evolution of portals or you know any of those sort of tools, client portals has been somewhat mixed and and sporadic in some cases. So it sounds like for IntelliFlow, this is this is a core part of that. Therefore, um, you would expect as you onboard things, it's onboarding the clients as as individuals. I mean, as opposed to just onboarding the practice. If it, so, it sounds like it truly is to get to extract that value to really get it humming. It's taking you know taking the client portal as a key part of that. Absolutely. So, I mean, for it to be really intuitive as a process and a process, an advice process or servicing process that engages advisors and clients alike, it's got to be integrated. So it's got to feel like one ecosystem. And that means it is one ecosystem. You don't, (laughs) you don't think of it as separate solutions. Um, In fairness, if you want to use third party cloud portals, that's fine too. You just choose one that's, that's also integrated by our API stack. Um, but the, the the advisors we see that who make the best of the technology use our own client portal because it's better integrated than others. That's, yeah. That's the reality. And fair enough, if that's also the sort of approach you're having is this is far more embedded, then it makes sense that the portal you've got does a lot of what they need. You know, so that sort of, that makes perfect sense. Um, is there it's a type of practice or size or approach or mentality that, that you find, you know, in Teleflow really works for and any others that say your team that are out there engaging with um, individual practices will go, oh, if I see that, generally they're going to struggle to take on the system. Is there any sort of standout that way? Um, not really. I, I don't think it's about uh, in this context, size doesn't matter. Yeah, um, yep. the, the reality, I'm going to be careful. Uh, <laughs> the reality is that if I look across the, the the firms that use our technology, you've got small small advice firms, you know, just one single advice firms, right the way up to our largest users that are 10,000 advisors plus, you know. So right, okay. we've got small firms and large firms. And so it, that doesn't really matter. It can it can appeal to firms of all, all sizes. But the, the thing that, distinguishes it most from the successes the successful users who really adopt the technology is a mindset it's not about so it's a mindset that says you know technology is going to be a differentiator for us it's not going to be something that we use because we have to they use it because they want to they want it to make a difference in the way they operate they want to be more effective they want to be more efficient they want to be more engaging with their clients they they want to really embrace the take the capability to make them advisors that are attractive to end end clients you know and they they want this doesn't it doesn't it doesn't take away from the relationships that yeah. advisors decent advisors uh have with their clients it em- embellishes them it, it makes them even better even more engaged and those are the kinds of firms that 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 uh, that make the most of the the, the solution 
And I guess, um, you know, another part of that, when when you've got a system that is like this, that sort of quite does a lot of the elements required, then I'm betting, um, therefore, there's elements of practice management or even license management that would get folded into that. Um, and that's that's something that's difficult to balance too from a tech provider is, well, compliance <laughs> would like this and would like that perspective, whereas the advisor user, well, they don't need to see that. I mean, it might need to be collected, but they don't need to see that. How do you guys balance that in terms of um, the way the tech works or even what people, you know, see where they're engaging? How do you, you balance those um, competing needs? So, so a few things. Firstly, um, we, we're a software as a service business, so multi-tenant yep. SaaS, and forgive the technology acronym, but it's really important to us. And that what that means is that there is just a single version of our software that operates across three uh, geographical regions around the world, the yep. US, the UK, and Australia. And that means every single firm using our tech is using that same version. Okay, So okay. that's really important for yeah. a start. Now, it's localized to each of those markets because there's different terminology, there are different product providers, there's different um, different tax rules and so on, all of that yeah. kind of stuff. But it's essentially the same tech. And what that means is because we've got over 2,800 firms using the same version of the tech is it has to be immensely configurable to deal with that 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 environment right. because every firm is slightly different. You know, They have a yeah. different approach to their documentations, their workflows, uh, how they show up to their clients, what they say, what they don't say, all of those kind of things. They're entirely different. And so it has to be a configurable solution. It's, right. This isn't customizing and writing code. In fact, there's not a single line of code, not a single line of code written for all those 2,800 different configurations. Yeah. Everything is configurable within the solution. Right. That gives a great deal of power to the advice firms who use our tech. It means they can get going pretty quickly. It means they can adapt things pretty quickly. So as their their needs change or the market needs change or the client needs change, they can react to that really responsibly. They're not coming back to us and saying, in Teleflow, we don't understand how this coding has been written or something. Can you change it? Because there is no coding. There's just yeah. configuration. They can yeah. they can they can do all of that, that kind of stuff. So that creates a real difference. And what it means um, is that when you're looking at the different user types within uh, an advice firm, so an advice practice, whether it's compliance or um, or the, you know, the the client facing advisor or anyone in between, they can configure a workflow that works differently for those different role types within the organisation, but have control and visibility across everything within right. that business. So that creates a real, we think that's really different in the marketplace. Yeah. And certainly, you know, configuration is so interesting, isn't it? Because like you say, you need to be able to react to a specific situation. And so even just from what is what is um, standing out to the team when they log in, you know, even on a client's base, something that flashes out at them, you know, that really stands out, that can change over time depending on what your focus for the team or the business is at that point of time. So just being able to, you know, shift according to that is powerful um, because we all know, um, you know, most people will look at a series of information and which is generally, you know, a system has a whole lot of information in it. If you just put it all in front of people, different people will notice different things. So you, there is some guidance you've got to give to that in terms of what you want people to focus on. You know, what's yeah, the thing you absolutely. always want them to notice, right? Um, so being able to configure that is important because like you say, each business will be different at what stage, what they're focusing on, what they want their team to ignore, whatever. Um, for that business, uh, yeah. so so that's exciting actually. And so then, you know, it's not a small system. This is not a one little thingy that you're doing deeply and well. So because of that, is there something that you you and your team would suggest that people do prior to you know shifting or taking on something like IntelliFlow? Is there is there um, any any work they should do to to optimize um, the implementation process or or the speed with which they can implement? Often that gets done on the way. So, okay. you know, so if you take things like data, data migration, migrating data from one system to another, so from whatever is the incumbent technology along, along to ours, yep. is a process that we handhold them all the way through. We've got teams who do this. We've got migration tools that have done, you know, over 2,800 firms have, have, have come into the technology. So we've, we've got a huge amount of experience in this. And what we, what we find most frequently is that advice firms aren't comfortable 
that the quality of the data that they've got at the moment in the system is as good yeah. as it could be. Yeah. So what we do is we clean it, we enhance it, we we get rid of duplication, and we do all of that kind of stuff as just part of the process. So it means when you bring the data in, you actually end up already on day one in a better place because we've right. cleaned the data as part of that. Um, we do think that's the right and the best place to do it. You could, as, a, as an advised practice, actually decide to do that in advance, and that's not a bad thing to do either. But mm-hmm. we've got capability to, to help you along the way. The other thing, I guess, and it comes back to that SaaS um, methodology, means that actually we've got perfect insight in every across all firms to say, this is kind of what works for advisors, and this is what doesn't in our experience. Right. You know? So we'll help them with the workflow. Workflow is incredibly um, powerful type stuff, but yeah. it's also easy to over workflow an organization, mm-hmm. you know, where you, where you mandate every single step along the way. And then suddenly you find that there are some, um, there are some examples and situations where it's mandated it too much and you need a yeah. bit more flexibility. Every yeah. firm's at a different point on that scale, but the reality is our customer success teams implement and work with firms to say, right, this is what we think works for an organization of your size, your profile, the kind of thing you're doing. And we so we like to apply that expertise to the software. The, the important thing is, the, I, 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 I say it frequently, I probably bore people on this, <laughs> but software as a service doesn't mean just providing the software. It's more about the service. You know, yeah. that relationship with, with, um, with our customers and then with us, we see as a partnership. And that's a partnership where a, basically... We want to make sure that this works for them as well as it possibly can. And that means we should be both partners in how to make sure it's configured well. It reacts to their changes as well. They don't feel that they're constrained. They don't feel that they have to come back to us for everything. But they do feel they'd like to come back to us for advice. And they yeah. do. And they regularly do. And I do think... Um it's probably you've you've tapped into one of my pet peeves um, because um, I've you know I, I, look I'm tech curious I am that person I go out and try all sorts of things out and outside of the advice world um, the thing that is done particularly well by you know rapidly growing tech you know Canva or things like this are a great example is they make it really easy to start and then really easy to learn more and become an expert like it's this journey they can take you on because they know their audience and they've seen it over and over again. Um, whereas what I struggle with in uh, the advice world here is is often there's a lot of tools, like as in resources, oh, yeah, there's a video on this, a video on that, but they're not giving you the insights of having seen people fail at this or seen the pitfalls they always hit. Or like we've only seen our practice. You guys have seen, like you say, hundreds and thousands of practices. So, you know, those insights are invaluable. Now, it doesn't mean that it's the same step-by-step process, but I'm betting there's the thing, don't start with this, it's unnecessary till later. Or if you don't get that right, these things won't work. You know, that sort of stuff is really valuable. Um, and it's that that insight, those those the insights from the pitfalls, I think, is, is such, such a great leg up for a practice. Um, and so recognizing that is exciting to me. I mean that, that that's great to hear, and it's certainly what we hear from advice firms as well. You know that 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 constant message. Everyone's slightly different in that regard, isn't it? Right. So you've got some firms, and we see this with technology outside uh, the advice space. That there's that sometimes we don't want to talk to anyone. We just want to go online and we want to browse yeah. videos or content or whatever to do something because that's that's where we are at that point in time, or that's the type of person we are. And you've got to create that capability. But others want to really talk through it, and they really want to understand and and learn from the sort of um, best practice experience from, from others. And there's no right or wrong answer to that. It's just that no. we're all different. And so long as you can provide an ecosystem where you can get both of those ends of the spectrum and anywhere in between, then I think mm. you're doing the right thing. And you, you've you mentioned workflows a couple of times, and I, I'd love to get a bit of a a clarification, I guess. So, um, you know, there is the workflow as in, you know, you might do something like this in the system and then it's going to remind you to do the next thing versus an automation where you do this thing in the system and then it automatically sends up the follow-up email. Where do you guys sit in that in terms of the way the tool can work uh, for a practice? So it it can do both. What we do find is that uh, that smaller advice businesses – actually tend to tend to be less prescriptive on the workflows yep um, because you know it, the reality is you've got a small number of people 
doing the jobs and they don't need to have sort of mission critical scalability in there <laughs> yeah. where there are teams working on on something they don't have that they have the benefit of, of not needing that but they then they have the challenges of not getting to that that scale necessary and then you see firms at the other end where actually yeah that automation is really important so that they can ensure things happen in exactly the same same way every time as again yeah. there's not a right or right or wrong answer to that no you choose you are the type of business you are, and you, you, you know, we we believe that we've got to meet advice firms where they are. There's no yeah. point trying to impose a set of principles or or processes on them that actually just aren't right for them at that that point in time. They may yeah. change over time, but you meet them meet them where they are, and the technology should do that. Yeah, I completely agree because all of us have a different team that are doing it too. So if yep. it's it's touching multiple different hands, that's different to one person that does a huge chunk of the work, as an example. You know, so it's you've got to be, you know, it's got to reflect that. Um, and I know for us, like we <laughs> just recently actually we picked up, we'd over automated one particular process and there were steps in there that were completely unnecessary. Like <laughs> We just yeah. overcooked it, you know, and we get together frequently. Luckily, the team are at the point now where that's a, literally a team meeting topic is how we're doing things and something that feel, it feels like we're doing that unnecessarily. Does anybody else think that? Um, and we talk that through a lot, but it's so easy to do. I sort of view it as a, a wonderful symptom of the fact that you are focusing on your processes, you are thinking about them. So I just figure it's a side effect, you know, this yeah. is what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And you, you also, Peter, you get that bit which is kind of not about work f- workflow in the traditional sense, which is kind of one task moving to another and automating yeah. some stuff. You also get that bit that, and we, we're really proud of this in, in, in our software, which is actually the user journey. And the right. user journey is created by UIs and wizards and so on that take you along that workflow without you knowing, kind of without you realizing, because it's just intuitive. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah in, fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be intuitive stuff. Yeah. It's got to be integrated. We like to innovate like that, and that that's a really important watchword for the business. And so we listen to what our customers are, are, are telling us. We upgrade the software regularly. You know, every day a new so- new capability goes in there, and much of it driven by our customers. We have something called customer inspired change, and you only get that when you listen to your customers about, and they're, yeah. they're saying, "Well, this works well, but it would be even better if it did this." And you know, if a number of firms are saying that, then you know what. It's going to do that. We're going to add that, add that upgrade to the capability. And it is, it is such a different way to look at things. I remember, I mean, I'm old enough and a whole lot of listeners are going to be say, Peter, I have no earthly idea what you're talking about, but I'm old enough to remember using a system in an insurance company that was DOS. So backslash F, backslash C, back, and you, you had to know what each of those codes meant to get you to the thing you were trying to get to, right? So it was like the training was, was so deep because like it's not like you could just work it out on the fly. There was no possibility of that. Um, these days, what I find interesting is how many systems still feel like the user experience is designed like that. Like you have to know to go to the thing and then the thing and then the thing to get to the final thing. You know, like it's, it's, it's not intuitive at all, uh, which doesn't make any sense given how smart tech is these days to me. You know, it's, it doesn't, why do we need to understand this branching of all the things you've got to branch down into to get to? So I agree with you. I think the more we have of that, then the thing is the faster you can get a new team member up to scratch, for example. You know, the the easier it is to have somebody just step in and take over from a team member who's sick or like all of that, just you don't need as much of this sort of IP of all of that understanding because the system can just sort of take you through it. Um, so, yeah, I completely agree. That's the user experience is so, so important. Yeah, and, and that's a reflection sometimes of where software is in the cycle and when it was built. So, you know, yes. your reference there, piece of DOS, was the reality is, there weren't really actually any alternatives at the time. No. So, of course, that was the way. You know, that, that's just kind of how it worked. And yeah. even the early days of Windows-based stuff, you know, actually was really complex. And I think, you know, very often in the old days, software was built by software engineers and software engineers in isolation who mm-hmm. are really good at what they do, but they aren't necessarily user experience people. And so, no. you know, the, the, good, the good, good software is built by a combination of people all with different strengths and disciplines and collectively as a team come together with something that's truly remarkable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, you've mentioned the portal um, and I'm betting that's the, I mean, that's the manifestation of sort of what the client experience can be um, with the system or with the advisor. 
you know, how far have you guys gone down in terms of what you can do or, or behave in the portal? So it sounds like uh, executing a document possible. So e-signatures, that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah. Um, data feeds, is that where, so it's reflecting something that's within the system that might be their portfolio or things like that. Is that, you know, that's available? Yeah. What, what other elements are there in the portal? That's all there. Um, there's a full gamified fact find. So a lot of advisors use this as their fact finding approach, you know, and, and, the, the reality is we think that's really important. The traditional mm. fact-finding approach, let's be honest, is a is a process whereby a client is asked lots of questions that they don't necessarily know the answer to. They find it quite challenging themselves. Sometimes those clients will guess because they feel a little bit awkward about something. They don't want to they don't want to feel uninformed about their finances. So you won't yes. necessarily even get the right answers. We we often call it a guess find rather than a fact find. Yep. But if you actually provide technology where the client themselves can fill in that find, then actually what they do is they fill in it, it in more accurately. They take yeah. their time overdoing it. It might take them a few few evenings at, at their own time and over their leisure, probably a glass of wine in their hand or something when they're <laughs> doing it. But they start adding more information than would have been added before. Right. And it's all done on their time. The advisor yeah. has to do nothing at that point, which means the advisor can, um, can concentrate on the value add, and their value add isn't fact finding collection. It's maybe the soft facts around fact finding, but definitely right. not the hard facts. Yeah, uh, and it's about the advice itself. So, so that creates a very different dynamic. We we, we love that capability. Um, we've got open banking capability as well. Certainly in yep. the in the UK, and we're bringing that to the Australian version um, in the in, in in the next few months as well. And that's really interesting because that's another element of that fact finding approach. It gives you real data about income expenditure. Where people are spending stuff, you know what's uh, what's essential expenditure, what's um, what's um, what's optional, and, and and so on. So that's yeah. a really interesting approach. We've got a really strong financial modelling capability, yeah. um, which is really really cool. And and I think one of the things I'm proudest about that. And people use use cash our cash flow modelling capability in front of the client yes. because it very clearly through the technology, not some dry document that is yeah. presented to a client and they don't understand it's actually visual engaging interactive technology that shows on the left side kind of where you are at the moment in terms of reaching you know meeting your hopes dreams and aspirations that mm -hmm. sort of goal setting and then on the right hand side what the value of the advice is to help you get there and you can very clearly illustrate the benefit of the advice and and you know for though for all of us in this in industry we understand the value of advice but clients yeah. often don't and so it's no. really important to ensure that clients do get a view actually this is this is what they're getting uh and and i think that kind of technology more more widely rolled out uh is actually what's going to solve some of the advice gap the advice gap that incidentally exists across the globe this isn't an <laughs> australian thing purely no. this is a you know uk has it us has it and and, and yeah. so on and so then um, presumably uh, the client can also, so if there's some documentation need or evidence of or whatever, they can upload that into the app. Is that something they can, you know, instead of using, yeah. so essentially, you know, avoiding email, this is the, the place where they provide that. What about, um, have you got to that stage where say there is a workflow that the advisor is working towards and there's something the client needs to do? Have you got to the point where that's sort of integrate, you know, the client gets it done and therefore it triggers something for the advisor? Is that yeah. is that there it's yet? In some areas, Peter, but okay. there are, we, it is one of the things we're looking to to, to Im improve on, so that the actual workflow definition can actually then drive change behaviour within the client portal. So, yeah. our client portal is called Personal Finance Portal. Mm -hmm. It's just a capability that you get within Office. You don't pay pay any extra for it. It's just part part of the solution. Yeah. Um, one of the things we love about it, and certainly that I, sh I should have mentioned, because you're right, we've got all that secure messaging and document signing and sharing bit that 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 that's that's kind of the basic capability but what we've also done with the technology is just like our core sort of practice management in teleflow office solution is we allow third party solutions to be built into the client portal okay. so you could go to a third party and say i really like what they've done in i don't know um risk profiling for example yep. i really like what they've done there wouldn't that be a great thing to have with within our client portal? Because you brand the client portal, right? Yep. So it's XYZ advisor firm. That yep. is their brand, their colors, and, and, and so on. And then you can choose a third-party solution or even build one if you want to that sits within that framework. So you can make you can have a client portal experience that is unique to your business. 
utilizing that technology. We think that's, a, we, again, we think that's a complete game changer, USB in, in, in the marketplace, and you can configure it so it's different for different clients of yours. So oh, as a awesome. client is going through a different journey with you, and that, you know, so initial client, maybe in that sort of early nurturing stage of a client, you might have a different set of screens and capability than for a client who's gone through full advice and maybe you're at the servicing end of the, of, of the relationship with that client. And it can show up differently to each of those different users in their journey. So same user, but the different stages in their, in their life with you. Yeah, that is exciting because that's, you know, I could see that then folding out. You might have um, certain offers that involve partners, like others that you've sort of, you know, other expertise you've factored in. Then then the, if I'd imagine getting creative, you can sort of start to fold that in where some wouldn't see um, taking them off to something that's about the other provider, but some would because they're the one that's yeah. part of the, you know, the, um, the service that you're offering to those clients. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. Yeah, absolutely, spot on, Peter. And ultimately, it comes back to the point that really, you know, we, we like to think that our technology is pretty great and we build lots of capability and it should deal <laughs> with most advisor needs. Yeah. But the reality is the marketplace keeps changing and there's some really great innovations that other businesses, often small businesses, are creating. And we don't, mm. we want to give them the oxygen to actually deliver capability out to advisors. That's really important. You shouldn't feel, I, in my view, as an advice practice, that you are restricted by your choice of technology provider, you should feel that you are um, that you are freed up to do what yeah. you want to do by your choice yeah. of technology Powered provider. Powered by, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree, and I think. You know, while there will always be some things that it makes sense, you know, so in terms of the sort of gorilla system like you guys have and the energy and the people you have that can apply attention to solve a particular problem, um, you can't be all things to all people. It's just not possible because the minute you do, you're the average. You know, it's it's not it's not the best solution. It's it's the average. Whereas if you can yeah. fold in some you know narrow um, providers, then you know the end result for you and the advice, you know, practices that work for you is heightened. I mean, a good example, you know, dive into these integrations. A good example is so product Rex, which is, you know, I mean, it's Nick is really another Nick. This is a, um, you know, it's built product Rex. It does this narrow thing, but geez, it does it well. Um, and so, you know, I was excited to see that you guys have that as one of the integrations because it solved a massive problem for a lot of practices. Yeah, no, he's, he's built a great a great capability, as you say, very relatively narrow in terms yeah. of what it does, but really good, and that's yeah. fantastic. You know, that's that's the kind of partners we love to have. Um, yeah. But we're open on that. You know, whoever the partner is, that's fine. Yeah, and so one of the other ones I saw on the list, which was timely because I actually interviewed them last week, was Oxford Risk. Um, and yeah, so and that's relative. I mean, the Aussies we're sort of relatively new to what they do and so um, in terms of a tool like that where would that get folded in or, or how would that integrate for example with uh, in tele- Teleflow where would that turn up um, in the system? So that that sits so the the Oxford risk integration is within our sort of advice flow and, and, yep. and the way that advice flow within for an advisor sits within the system which takes them through a set of steps one bit of which obviously is the is the risk profiling set aside or yeah. ATR, um, and so that that's kind of how that sits. But in f- in future, they may want to start integrating with our client portal capability. I mean, the, yeah. that that new architecture for, for the client portal we actually only released in December, okay. um, and it's interesting actually. We released it across all three regions: UK, US, and Australia at exactly the same time. You know, so that's the nature of having a single okay. version offering. It means you're not restricted by the version that you're on, not being a- able to access this particular capability. Everyone can access this because there is just a single version. Uh, yeah, because there's nothing more frustrating than, than seeing some great press or, or, a, or a release on something and then you can't get that version. It's heartbreaking. I'd prefer to not know about it, you know, if that's the case. Yeah, yeah. You know, don't tell me about this wonderful thing I can't do. Um, yeah, okay. That's, so that's great. I mean, that sort of broad approach Um is well it's just it makes a lot of sense doesn't it it just makes sense um that it's that easy is there any features or or sections in the the sort of suite of tools you've got that you think practices or advisors don't really take enough advantage of that you think are maybe the maybe a little unloved but have some real gold in there if people sort of understood what they could do and then you know incorporated them into their practice 
I mean, there, there's stuff like some of the compliance stuff, actually. Uh, compliance often, I think, is reserved. Proper compliance processing is often reserved for the larger organizations. They're the ones right. who really focus on this. But the reality is there's some there's some benefits to process even for the smaller organizations to use. So they yep. don't and, – and, and I think that's one of these interesting areas where actually – Compliance, in some respects, can deliver on multiple levels. It's don't yep. just think of it as compliance. Think of it as kind of uh, ensuring that you're following a consistent way of delivering your advice, which actually yep. then means you can be more scalable, which if you want to as a business means you can then take on more more clients and more yep. advisors and so on, and you can grow more effectively. That's one of those things that I think sometimes, sometimes gets misunderstood. Mm. Um, I do think um, if we were going back maybe – six or seven years, I would say we were at a point where even just the client portal technology itself, a lot of advisors were fearful actually of the technology right. and the, how it was going to disintermediate in their view, their relationships with their, their clients. And you know, yeah. and here we are six, six years or so later, and now 98% of the advisors who use our technology in the UK use our client portal. Yeah, okay. That's the reality. So you know, it, and at one point it was 0% and 0% saying that they needed a client portal, that that has changed immensely. Yeah. So I think it's really easy, and that's just in six short years, I think it's really easy to say, this isn't right for us, and that's fine, but review that because yeah. the marketplace reviews. Yeah, and I think <laughs> the way we ask those questions is important too. I think it's so easy to, to oh, let's survey that client base, or you know, at every review meeting I want you to ask a few things. Do you think you need a client portal? Well, of course the client's probably going to say no. They don't know what it is. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? Whereas saying, would it be easier if on the fly these things you could just do when you're on the bus and you could tick something and it would authorize? Oh, yeah, actually, that sounds really good. Like whatever the yeah. whatever the thing is, you've got to ask the right questions um, because oh, it's ridiculous. I mean, I feel that a, that way a little bit about um, the cost of advice, you know, to the consumer and our and we're very focused on, gee, we need to have that scalable offering or people won't pay for advice. And I feel like sometimes the question's wrong. I feel like the messaging we've got back so far is people won't pay for the advice the way it's delivered now. <laughs> you know, they might write a couple of thousand dollar check for it being delivered a different way or it being packaged together a different way. So, you know, the way the way we ask those questions is so important. Um, and with tech, of course, we're just embedded with it now. This is something that it, nobody's questioning whether we live with technology every minute of every day. So now it's probably a matter of if you don't have one, you've got to have a really good reason not to have a client portal probably. We're, we're probably going to get to that point, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think we're pretty much there already in my, in, yeah. in my view, PC, because I don't see how you can operate, you know, in 2023, I don't see how you can operate a business without understanding that most of your clients, maybe not all of them, but most of your clients will want some form of digital engagement. When, when we look at us, the stats of those uh, of, of um, clients using um, the, the client portal technology in, in, in the UK, mm. we see that a decent percentage, just under 40% of it, is used outside office hours. Right. Okay, so... How do you deal with that? Yeah. How do you deal with that engagement, that interest, that updating of information, that clarification of information if you don't have a client portal? Yeah. And the honest answer is you either work 24-7 and you're always online, and mm -hmm. you know, some, some, some people are, that's okay, mm -hmm. um, or you have a client portal, yeah. <laughs> one of the two. <laughs> yeah. And I think the, the whole convenience thing for the client, we I probably don't – take enough, you know, or make enough allowance for. Um, I don't know about you, but I love, you know, when I go onto something, it, any sort of tool that I'm going to have to, you know, a website and I'm trying to dig into something, if I can go onto a chat and just get some clarification while I'm there, you know, it's such a relief. You know, the whole, yeah. um, you know, if I've got to send an email to a generic email address and wonder if they're going to reply, like, now that works, but it's a different experience. You know, and so recognizing that people are doing this, like you say, in their own time, it could be 2 a.m. because they've finally got a moment to themselves and they're going through all their financial stuff and they think of something, oh, forgot to ask Peter this or whatever it is. Um, yeah. We need to, you know, really think about that more carefully. Um, yeah. I think, you know, and, and I think the other thing I'd say, you mentioned scale, you know, and, and I mean, it's an interesting environment now where, 
uh, particularly maybe new entrants to the advice market in terms of advisors or practices, um, they probably, you know, some of them resist, you know, growth for growth's sake. Um, they're, they're sort of building a lifestyle um, business. And so often when they see things that are about scale, they think it doesn't apply to them. And and the thing is you can build some processes and some efficiency and some workflows, like you say, into your practice and you might be able to have your whole team only work four days a week. Like you could become yeah. an employer of choice because you shut down Fridays every week, you know, so it doesn't have to be you go from one to 20 advisors, right? Um, yeah. It's about the way you use that time. It's a really good po- point, Peter. And it also talks to understanding that you're not just choosing your technology. You're not just choosing it for the advisors and you're not just choosing it for your clients. You're also choosing it for your staff and your colleagues. You know, yeah. they want to have technology that actually frees them up does away with some of the things that are challenging or boring or dull to do and means that they can provide a value add. And if you choose to use that to scale your business, that's fine. That's great yeah. if you want to if you want to grow larger. But you don't have to. You can choose to do that to to free up time in 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 other in other ways. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, is there, in terms of then, you know, what's coming down the track, what you guys have in the pipeline, what's what's on the radar or what's, you know, soon to to be released into the future for Intellifo? Um, quite a bit of stuff. I mentioned the the open banking stuff that we're that we're bringing to the uh, client portal, uh, personal balance portal in um, just in a few months here in, in, in Australia. Uh, we're also going to be bringing in some capability around joining up the financial modeling capability with that client portal capability. So actually yep. you can share financial modeling scenarios directly with the client in an interactive format that they can yep. continue to live and breathe through or incidentally vice versa. So the, the client can start with it. And and that I think that's a really interesting dynamic. So that's mm. going to be that's going to be something we're bring, bringing to um, bring to the marketplace this year and a host of other things. <laughs> there's, there's a, yeah, we, Innovation is really important to us, and actually, yeah. if you've got a soft, if you've got a software as a service backbone, you have to innovate because yeah. you've got all the ingredients to allow innovation to happen. You've got all the code in one place; everyone on the same version. It means you can evolve and innovate. If you yeah. don't, it's really difficult because you've got yeah. software in different branches, different versions. People who haven't upgraded, people who have upgraded. How do you support all of that? That's uh, you know, that's really, really challenging. And for you in terms of, I mean, because you've been there from the beginning, of course, then is there anything a little further down the track that's the, oh, I'll be excited when we get to this point? Like, is there any of that that you're sort of looking ahead and, and um, you know, hoping, wishing, pushing um, <laughs> the team ultimately to get to uh, down the line? Oh, I always, oh, I always want the next new thing, right? <laughs> the yeah. pizza is probably, it's probably a flaw in my, 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 my makeup. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we need a support um, group, I think. People like that. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And you always want to continue to innovate and continue. And, and actually, it, there is an important point there. I think, you know, a well grounded, um, software vendor, and we think we're one, actually does recognize that actually, Yes, it, there's lots of stuff that's important about the shiny new thing, but you've also got to make sure that customers use the technology that's there today and not right. just build the new things. And that means you want to continually in, enhance in a, all the small things as well. Right. You know, and you only get that by listening to customers who might say, I like this capability, but I have to do five clicks. Is there a way I could do two clicks and said, and that doesn't sound like very much, but if I'm doing that a thousand times a day, that's really impactful for me. And you need to listen to your yeah. customers to understand that stuff. Sometimes that's actually quite trivial to build. And so, you know, it's a win-win for absolutely everyone. And that's yeah. uh, so it's not just the big, shiny new things. Sometimes yeah. it's even the small stuff as well. Look, and the multiple click things is I'm obsessed with that yeah. um, because you're right. It's the multiple things you do mul- multiple times a day, but also it's a training issue then because they've got to know how to get through the click throughs. Um, you yeah. know, and it's one of the biggest issues with the product provider sites is you've got yes. to know where that thing lives. Um, uh, so I completely agree with you on that front. Is there, a, I'm curious about your view too. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of where, 
data or the way we represent it could go. Um, the industry is notoriously bad at getting to the point of infographics or real imagery to capture. We sort of, we can't let go of a graph. You know, it's very hard for us to do anything aside from some sort of column based or dot based graph. Do you see that changing over time where we can get a bit cleverer, a bit more artistic about the way we are representing some of this data? So it's, it's, um, a bit more beautiful maybe than it is now. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that, Peter, because it's one thing. I did forget forget to mention about stuff that's coming 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 this year is um capability we call business intelligence yep. and, and essentially one of the things we did last year was we migrated all of our systems globally onto a single AWS infrastructure so everything okay. is in Amazon AWS yeah um, um which is kind of you know if you're a small vendor today just starting up that's where you go anyway yeah but for us long established vendors it's actually quite a job to, to to migrate all of that and move across you know we had okay. eight million lines of code that we had to rewrite to do it so it wasn't a small it wasn't a small job at all yeah but one of the benefits of being being there aside from scale and performance and all that kind of stuff is that it gives us access to capability that we never had access to before right so we've been working with um amazon um, as a sort of a, a prestigious partner of theirs on a global basis to, to bring their Amazon QuickSight capability, which is business intelligence with infographic capability along to all of our data, to all of our users as just a core part of the solution. So Fantastic. it's going to visualize the data in a way that you've never seen before. I don't think the advice sector has seen before, no. uh, either here or in the UK in fairness. You know, this is, yeah. again, this is, uh, groundbreaking for the UK as, uh, as well. So we're really excited to do that. One of the bits we're doing as part of that is ensuring that the data itself, and I don't just mean select bits of our data, but all the data can be shared in a Snowflake account for firms as well. So they can okay. integrate it with whatever other data they've got just by signing up, signing up to that. So it creates um, a real democracy over the data. Mm. We'd like to think that most people will use just the the, the the, the standard sort of dashboards and info, insights infographics that we'll have within the solution. And I think for many firms that will be that will be brilliant and you know game changing enough for them. Yeah. But there'll be some firms and particularly at the larger end of town who say, yeah, actually you know, we want actually want the data itself and and right. so we can we can empower both of those with that same uh, best in class technology. Yeah. And look it isn't it's it's a mindset shift that is um it's difficult for lots of people to understand because they don't know the difference. So, so you know, there's raw data, there's a representation of data, i.e. graph or, or similar thing, and then there's something that's pure insight, right? So it's yeah. literally giving you the answer that you need to conclude. Um, and what we do generally sits very firmly in the middle of where you need to interpret the data and the graph to get the insight, right? And I think that's the shift that I'm going to be excited about is when it's easier, when you don't need to translate every graph, you know, yeah. you don't. And I, I mean, you just got to go to a fund manager session and and watch some of those when they've got to, it takes them 10 minutes to talk you through the graph. And I'm like, oh, this is this is the difference. This is not what we should be providing, you know? Well, um, and we do that as advisors too, you know? It's well, like, no, 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 no. Where's the infographic that just gives the insight? <laughs> exactly. You you want the infographic to be understandable in itself. You want it to be interactive so you can drill down into a point and get more information as you drill down. So that's yeah. about interactivity. You know, they it shouldn't yep. just be a, a static, static graph. Yeah. It should be something you can actually actually power down into. And then the third thing, and again we're doing this with the Amazon QuickSight stuff, is having a layer of machine learning on top of it, which right. creates what it does, actually the technology looks for patterns and displays them to you in English, in just words, this is what we've noticed from this data. That's yeah. you know, that, that, that's incredible. Because not it everyone is. actually, on, you know, not everyone looks at graphs in, or in charts in the same way. You know, we all no. spot slightly different things. And so, some people actually don't react well to that. Some people would prefer a sentence to describe Correct. it. Correct. And in fact, I would argue most don't react well because they've got yep. scarring that has to do with school <laughs> maths and like all of this. Like most of them aren't nerds like me, you know, like that, that actually, woohoo, a graph, you know, like that's not yeah. how most people react. So I think, yeah. you know, adjusting for that is exciting. And I, I was learnt this lesson, um, taught this lesson, sorry, by actually it was a graphic designer who pointed out to me that the only data or graphical representation of data that's ever gone viral are those, you know, Time Magazine or, you know, those infographics that are capturing something over oh, time, yeah. interactive, 
blobs. They're blobs. They're not charts in the typical sense. They're blobs and size and color and they're interactive and they're like, and you can yeah. instantly get the point. Like you yes, don't need yeah. to be a rocket science to get it. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> now I'm seeing the difference. <laughs> you know, that's a level of understanding that's quite different to communicate. Um, so, and fingers crossed, you know, we'll all keep our fingers crossed. We can get to that sooner rather than later. Is there, well, there is something I can think we've missed actually before I say, is there anything we've missed? You've got um, the community. So that's the community of users, I'm presuming, that can all interact. Talk me through uh, what's involved in that and, and what value that can deliver for a practice. Yeah, it's it's a capability that essentially captures a lot of information. So standard stuff like um, training materials, we talked about training materials, help guides, or all, all of yep. that kind of kind of capability. But it's also a community where users can come together to answer commonly held questions that they might each have. Right. So this this has been running in the UK for for, for years now, and it's fantastic because you get the engagement of advisors helping each other out, and we're there too, right? So we're yep. there to to help, but it's actually really nice often for uh, for an advisor from firm A to hear from other firms about how they've done something, and yeah. you know how they how, how they've achieved a particular uh, a particular outcome. And so that's we really like that. It's a it's a fantastic way forward. We're going to continue to power and improve what we do within that, um, uh, and and see that very much as kind of like the first step to allowing advisors to help themselves, but also to gain access to other advisors. If your firm wants to enable you to do that, you know, some some firms, particularly large firms, sometimes turn off that capability, and that's fine. Right. Um, but it's up to you. You know, if you yeah. want to have that, if you, if you want to have that that access to information, then you can do. And look, the truth is that um, there isn't a developer out there who will manage to shortcut a five step in a system. Um, that's any anywhere near as quick as a user will. And particularly, yeah. I think admin users, like I always hand something to the admin team and within seconds they've worked out ways to shortcut they things, um, exactly. potentially break it too, but also, you know, like those shortcuts. And so being able to share those, um, you know, collectively. And I guess, do you guys do that via region or, or can it be sort of, you know, so, so could we be talking to advisors in the UK about how they use it? And it's regional specific at the moment. Yep. So, you know, so, so there's, there's, Austra you're either in Australia and you're talking with just Australian people or you're, uh, or you're in the UK and you're just talking with UK users. Yeah. Um, uh, and some of that is because the regional differences of the localization mean that actually some things aren't, aren't appropriate uh, from, from yeah. one, one capability to another. So we think that's the right approach. That may change though over time. Be a piece of, you know, as our user user base grows in in all three territories, we might see that there's some really healthy crossover areas. So the capability, the technology that we that we use to power that is capable of of sharing. That we just decided not because we think that's the, the the right approach at this point in time. Yeah, of course. And I guess you know it probably depends on elements of the system. Some bits, you're right, it yeah. just wouldn't be relevant. Um, whereas others are just you know probably similar in each location. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can see that making sense. Anything else we've skipped over or missed, do you think? Oh, we've covered quite a lot, I think, haven't we? we? Have. It's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. We have. Well, and it feels like it's a bit of long as a piece of string too. So um, I think that at some point um, th there's been a lot of focus and interest in client portals. So at some point we may even even have a chat just going a bit deeper on the portal itself um, into the future. I think I get asked a lot about um, each of the portals. So we, we can consider that folks down the track. But um all right, Advice Explorers, uh, if you'd like to find out more about IntelliFlow, then the website link uh, is in the episode show notes, along with Nick's LinkedIn details. Now, that <laughs> Nick will need to point you in the right direction of the local people to handle that. So um, perhaps, you know, if you'd like to give him a big high five for the, uh, for the episode, feel free, but perhaps use the website to connect with the Australian team. Um, as, as the CEO, I'd imagine he doesn't necessarily handle the sales queries that much. But um, thank you, Nick, so much for joining us and I guess for bringing a large-scale competitor to the Australian market. You know, I, I love anybody that can keep the other he other heavyweights on their toes. That's a good thing for everybody. So so thank you for bringing that out here and, and um, giving us more options. Good stuff, Peter. No, thank you. And, you know, people absolutely can reach out to me on LinkedIn. But we also <laughs> do have – we have a fantastic team here in Australia yeah. um, who, are, who are all great people, passionate about what we do, here to help. Lovely. Thank you so much for your time. 
So, are you a current user of IntelliFlow? I know they haven't been around the Aussie market for a super long time, but there certainly are practices that are successfully using it out there. Um, maybe you've already embarked on a transition from another tool to IntelliFlow. Uh, do you agree with what we covered? Do you have some other insights? Please share your uh, any lessons you've learned or any experiences you've had on the Ensemble platform as we'd all love to hear your take. Uh, certainly any tips, tricks, you know, insights, uh, pitfalls to be wary of, any of those things for any of these tech tools we should absolutely share on the community. Now, as for my thoughts, look, as more of the bigger tech players, and by big, I mean tools that cover a lot of the advice elements, right? So these sort of bigger guerrilla systems, um, as more of those bigger ones have open architecture at their core, then the flexibility available to our practices is going to improve by leaps and bounds, right? This is just going to accelerate um, the rate at which we can implement different things and really cobble them together in our own tech stack. So, what this is saying is this will mean we can combine more tools together than we ever have been able to f- ever have been able to before. Now, this is great right? But it also means that there will be loads of different combinations businesses will come up with. And, you know, this can lead for, for you know, those of you out there who are still in the early stages of building its tech stack, then it can result in overwhelm, right? Because you're looking around and everybody's got different combinations and it all seems very complicated. So, you know, what should you do and how should you build it for your practice? And when, you know, you reach this sort of state of confusion, it's natural. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, welcome to the state we're all in. But, um, you know, whenever I see people re- sort of reading, reaching that stage of confusion, I always encourage them to get the team together and really step back from the nitty gritty and brainstorm the main challenges the team are facing. And this is across all the roles. This is not just from an advisor's perspective. This is across the whole team. Let everyone sort of vote on the priority or the impact of every idea everybody comes up with. What are all the things that we're facing? We put them all up on the wall. Everybody votes. And you ideally, you want to identify the top, say, three that are these big things that we could, if we improved it, it'd really make a difference across the team and across the business. And only then consider how tech may be a part of the solution for those three big challenges. You know, generally this is when the next best tech choice becomes clear. Yeah. So, so don't start with a tech, start with a challenge, start with something that you're trying to solve um, and then find the solution. Secondly, uh, as as you will have noticed with that discussion uh, with Nick, we should all be demanding a lot more of our tech providers. And what I mean by that is in terms of our onboarding experience and how we get to know the tool, be sure they can answer where the best place to start might be for your practice. You know, what should we do first? What should we do second? What should we leave till much later? Yeah. Um, what are the pitfalls to avoid, right? Where are the areas that most firms can get the most initial value? Now, of course, we're all different, right? And and that makes sense. But um, they have, they should have seen lots of businesses use their tool right? And they should have been watching how they went with that and hence can come up with some really wonderful insights for you. You know, don't make the same mistake as all the other practice. Make your own mistakes, right? So so I would uh, be wary of any tool, particularly the bigger ones, that doesn't want to engage in the onboarding process, that doesn't want to provide you with those insights or merely doesn't have them right? They should be trying to make this as easy as possible. It shouldn't feel too big. It should feel like you've got a trusted guide with you that can step you through how you're going to implement this in the practice, um, particularly for the big core systems. So just keep that in mind. Let's demand more of them uh, and ensure that they really are using all that insight they'll have from their perspective of implementations of their tool. Now, as you know, there is only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity. And to help you with that habit, today's Curiosity Corner app that caught my eye is called Circle. Now, you can find it at circle.so, and their tagline is creating 
a thriving community you can be proud of. So this is an online community platform. In a very simple sense, think your own Facebook, right? So Facebook is a community platform uh, where we all get together to integrate, sorry, to interact on the Ensemble platform. That's a community platform, right? And Circle is another one of these. Now, if you're not sure, you know, whether Peter, is that something I would ever need? Um, well, this can be people use this sort of thing, I mean, across all sorts of industries. So these examples I'm using across all the sorts of industries um, and they can be customer communities. So it could be a way that your customers can interact with, uh, with each other, right? So if you're the niche advisor for people that do marathons, <laughs> Like you could get all your your customers together and let them have their own community, right? It might be that you've got a, a course uh, that you take clients through. And so this is a community that can step them through the course as they progress. Maybe you've got a membership program that they're a part of. This can help you run the membership program. Maybe you're providing a combination of broader content, but one-on-one -on -one coaching. This can help you manage that. So it's a tool really that sort of brought together a whole lot of things that people had to have separate tools for, and it's now in the one place. So it, you know, it's sort of, and it, it looks a lot like Facebook in that sense. So when you log in, there's groups down the left-hand side, there's content you can go in and out of, and then you, there's your feed um, based on where you are and what, what you've registered for or follow. Um, you can have uh, a member directory, you could have content delivered, all of those basics. You can then live stream into Circle um, so that you can be offering content ongoing that's then, of course, recorded and saved within there that somebody can go back and look at. You can have live events, um, you can have digests, you know, so your newsletter and that sort of thing could be distributed via Circle. And it can have, of course, it's got a paywall, so it's got paid memberships. It can have section of the community that requires payment, whereas others can be free. You can have upsells from one to the other, free trials, coupons, discounts, recurring subscriptions, right? <laughs> All and sundry. Um, so, and there's thousands of integrations. So I mentioned this because while, um, a lot of people may not be doing, I don't know, cash flow programs or things like that. You might use drip fed content or something that steps them through an experience with some learnings. You might be trying to do that. And this is a place that can live. Yeah. So, um, it has a lot of support. There's a huge um, community behind it, of course. So, you know, it's a community tool. Of course, they're going to have a great community. And they have lots of examples of um, communities out there that you can learn from. It's very intuitive. The tool, you know, encourages gifts and emojis, all sorts of things that make it feel really engaging. And it's super quick and easy to get started. Um, so if that – I bring it up merely because it's something that may – make something a unique uh, experience for you, for your clients. It is not ludicrously expensive um, for what it is at all. Uh, and it may just solve that little problem that you were trying to work out yourself. I'd love to hear if you do utilize it. Um, if you check it out and you think it's interesting, uh, then I have actually run a program on this. So be happy to give you some feedback. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Welp. That's all we've got for this week, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you'd like a speaker to help your audience debate the business case for client portals, uh, including a step-by-step -step process to work out if you need one and how to implement it in the practice, um, then I can either provide perhaps an initial web webinar on the topic or even a full-blown in-person masterclass. It just depends on what your group of advisors um, would be best served by. Uh, we'll also be covering this in our Niche Down and Scale Up Masterclass next week, along with helping you work out exactly who you want to serve in 2023. If any of that is of interest, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD, P E I T A M D. But uh, as for the Niche Down and Scale Up Masterclass, I'd get in fast as there's actually a prep session early next week for those taking part, and you wouldn't want to, want to miss out on that. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. <laughs>